So today I'll be talking to you guys about shipping multiple device trees um, and identifying which device tree uh, to load for your device. So just a quick introduction. Um, my name is Elliot. Uh, I'm a Linux kernel developer at Qualcomm uh, based in San Diego. Um, some things I've been working on recently is uh, the Gunya hypervisor. Uh, you might have seen my name posting all those patches. Um, before that, I was doing a lot of kernel build, Android kernel build stuff. Um, and I also enabled, did a lot of enablement for uh, GKI for Android um, and Qualcomm. Um, so just a really quick kind of introduction. So if, for those who don't know, device trees are uh, a way of describing hardware. Um, the kernel authors these usually. Uh, there's other folks who author them as well, Zephyr, FreeBSD, U-Boot, although there's a lot of effort to try and consolidate that thanks to <laughs> some talk earlier today. Um, but usually what happens is the bootloader picks up the device tree and passes it to the kernel somehow, um, or sometimes the device tree is appended to the kernel if your bootloader doesn't have support for that. Uh, generally, the kernel doesn't own the bootloader. It leaves it to the ecosystem to package and pick up the DTP that it wants. So you'll see that U-Boot does something different from, say, Android boot process, which does something different from Grub and does something different from Core Boot. And so, um, you know, uh, we're, we're trying to sort of consolidate how that's going to work, and we'll go through that. Um, ideally, the DTP would come from firmware. Uh, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of uh, sort of hard realities that make it that way. That's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, and I'd like to try and solve this problem today. Well, not today, but you know, soon, uh, and not wait for vendors to figure out how to get their firmware all sorted out. Cool. Um, so yeah, the talk is about picking the DTB. So maybe you just have one DTB, and you just know what board you're running on, and you just say, yep, that's the DTB I want. When you, when you do your build command, you just say, pick up SM, uh, you know, QRD, or QRB5165 RB5 DTB. You pass that into your make boot image or your fit image or whatever, and it just, that's what you have. Um, or you concatenate the image to your DTB, and then you have a concatenated uh, kernel and DTB. That works too. Um, or maybe you have a multi-DTB bootloader that can figure out which bootloader to pick. Um, but the, and so the focus of this talk is just on picking the DTB. We're not talking about how to package DTBs. Uh, I kind of want to leave that to like a little bit of a different uh, discussion. Um, you know, it's just how do we pick the DTB? So why would you want to ship multiple device trees? Uh, device manufacturers might want to ship one bi binary, uh, one software binary to a variety of devices. Um, so for instance, Qualcomm, we want to ship a single software package that supports all of our reference devices um, for a given generation. Um, and we have a lot of different reference devices. OEMs might want to package a software or have a single software package that supports, you know, they have, you, you have your iPhone, your iPhone Pro or your Galaxy S22 and your Galaxy S22 Max or whatever. Um, and you want to just have a single software package for that. Um, I think this is kind of applicable to a lot of embedded world as well. Um, you know, it receives, it reduces friction when receiving a new board. You just receive a board. I don't know what I got. Well, you probably know a little bit about what you got, but you may not know exactly what board you got. It'd be nice if you could just load some image that says, okay, this has all the Qualcomm DTPs on it. We'll figure out, uh, you know, what board, what DTP to really pick uh, later on. So why, what kind of differentiation does boards have? Uh, they could have different sensors, different displays, coprocessor attachments, so different GPUs, and maybe a different modem maybe a different WLAN chip, different PMIX. There's all sorts of different differentiation that could happen on different boards. Um, and so that kind of motivates why you might want to package uh, multiple DTPs into a single software image. So devices from Qualcomm. Um, uh, <laughs> we have... SOC hardware identifier, hardware identifier registers. Um, that's one way that we identify which board uh, you run on. So for instance, we have SM8650. There's a register that you can read, and that identifies that that's the, the board or the SOC that you're running on. Um, we also have this thing called a configuration data table called CDT. Um, and it answers which reference board is this. So Qualcomm produces many different uh, reference boards, but some of the common ones that you might be familiar with are HDK, uh, Robotics dev kits, so like the RB platforms. Um, Auto dev platform is also another kind of popular one now that's coming out. Um, and it also, the CDT, so the CDT will say, you know, this is the HDK, this is the RB kit, this is the Auto dev platform. 
It'll also describe what else is attached. So is, does it have the vision kit attached for like a RB3 or RB5? Uh, does it have a display? What kind of display does it have? Um, what kind of PMIX does it have? Um, it's not really a device tree. It just is like kind of a number that says, okay, well, this is the device tree that it has. Um, this is kind of data that's stored in EEPROM. Um, you can think of it as just some hard-coded bits that are assigned to this particular device. Um, and generally, hardware features are encoded in the board version. Sometimes they're different uh, identifiers. It kind of just depends on what sort of the vendor feels like doing or what the OEM feels like doing. Um, so for instance, we sometimes will just increment a minor number version to say there's a different um, Wi-Fi chip or there's a different display. We'll just increment the minor number of the board um, or we'll have an entirely separate field. It's kind of independent. Um, but Qualcomm will package, have one software package and we, you can see we have, I took some numbers and I found that we would ship 20 DTBs and over 100 overlays. So that means we have over 100 boards that we want to try and support in a single software package, which is a lot. You think that's a lot. It's actually even more than that that we support. So um, we have hardware identifiers, uh, SKUs, and we have even more SKUs uh, than just the 100 overlays that we have, the 100 boards that we have. Um, so the SKU will encode things like DRM manufacturer and who manufactured the UFS chip and all sorts of different stuff that you know maybe software doesn't necessarily always care about all these different things. Um, and demuxing that SKU can require a lot of software updates and firmware to say, okay, well, I know Every single time you produce a new board, now we got to uh, go update our software and say, you know, just because we updated the DRAM, um, we have to go do a software update. So um, folks may be familiar, if you're familiar with Qualcomm hardware, uh, we have these old MSM ID, board ID, and PMIC ID. Um, so the Android bootloader, ABL, will read these identifiers from the CDT and the SOC hardware registers. Um, and map them into basically some sort of bit field um, that's called MSM ID, board ID, and PMIC ID. And our bootloaders will read all these DTBs, and they all have this MSM ID in, in it, and they'll try and match and say, okay, well, I read the SOC hardware identifier register, and I read the MSM ID, and they both match what I'm expecting it to be. This is, must be the right DTB. And they'll do this for all, all of these different fields, and we have kind of a, a pretty complicated algorithm sitting behind it that isn't all that great, but we're trying to, you know, get something that's common. Um, so a decade ago or longer, um, we tried to upstream the MSM ID, um, but it was rejected because the kernel doesn't use the MSM ID, and there was kind of this feeling that, you know, the kernel should always be using um, the fields that are described in the DTB. I think that's changed a little bit now recently, um, but uh, the consensus back then was we should have, um, you know, if we were going to plug the MSM ID, the kernel should care about the MSM ID as well. So we tried documenting using compatible strings. I think that's kind of the consensus current upstream approach is use a compatible string. Um, it didn't catch on. We created this nice uh, format for <laughs> describing <laughs> uh, a compatible string based off of the, all the information that we want to mux off of. And yeah, you can see it, it just gets kind of, uh, there's a laser here, it gets kind of crazy. Uh, I purposely made it you know, off the screen, but, um, and there's even more, this was a decade ago, there's even more things that we want to try and mux off of now. Um, and so one of the kind of key points here is that it requires custom parsing. Um, the CDT is going to encode all the information. You're going to have EEPROM that says this is all the different things that it has. It may be that you always ship a device, this board, with UFS, but your CDT is going to say, yep, you have UFS, and you're never going to need to change and say that, oh, well, now I'm shipping with EMMC or NAND flash. Um, but you, know, you want to differentiate that because your DTB is going to change. Um, so how do you parse that string? Uh, do you just say, okay, well, you've got to describe all that information, even if it never changes. Well, now you get this really long, D this really long compatible string. Or you have some sort of like default fallback option and you try and do all this logic for saying, well, if you don't specify it, then it's okay if it's this value. And that just gets really complicated to do and that's not portable across bootloaders, um, right? It's gonna pretty much always live in just ABL and nobody else is gonna ever be interested in uh, taking Qualcomm's this. <laughs> um, so one of the things we also tried to do was encode that information outside of the DTB into a DT image. So this is kind of similar to what uh, U-Boot does. Um, so we just basically 
lifted the MSMID off of the, what was in the DTB and put it into some metadata that was outside uh, the image, outside the DTB itself, uh, into some header file. Um, the problem with this approach was we were still having MSMID in our DTBs. Uh, it does kind of hard to, in your build system, describe, well, this DTB needs the, this MSMID, and you have to sort of pull it along in the entire build process, and you might be trying to apply overlays to that DTB during the build process. Uh, it just gets really kind of complicated to have be tracking that metadata separately um, from just having it nicely encoded inside of the DTB. Um, yeah, so the, some of the upstream approaches, um, the first one that pretty much everyone talks about is just use the compatible string. Like I mentioned, uh, it requires string parsing, and that can get really complicated. Um, it requires porting the parsing of that compatible string to every single bootloader that you care about supporting. Um, it's used by, I think, Chromebook. Um, I think it's also used by Tegra, as far as I can tell. Uh, if there's anyone else here, I'm sorry I didn't mention you. I was doing research and trying to find upstream people who are, seem to be doing something that has some format. Um, but yeah, compatible strings also often include the SOC. Uh, but board X, DTB isn't going to work on board Y, even if they have the same SOC. So frequently you'll see a board DTB that says, well, I'm a you know, Chromebook X, and I'm also a QCOM SC blah, blah, blah chip. But you're not a, that same QCOM SC blah, blah, blah uh, number SM, like say SM6115, isn't going to work on some other board that is also based off of an SM6115. Um, so you know, if you have this fallback of compatible strings, it's going to get weird if, say, you don't find a match. Um, another approach that's kind of been talked about was just put all of your nodes in the DT and let the bootloader figure out what to enable or disable. Uh, the problem with that is it creates a contract between bootloader and device trees. And if you're not using, say, U-boot or uh, an upstream bootloader that definitely is relying on Linux, it's not going to work as soon as um, you, know, you want to upstate the device tree to not have a node or you want to add a new node and the bootloader is expecting it to have some node and fix-ups are just going to start to fail. What do you do when the fix-up fails? So some downstream approaches. I've talked about what Qualcomm does. It's MSMID and board ID. It's a bit field containing some magic constants from some ROM region. Uh, as far as I know, Google Pixel uh, has a very similar approach to Qualcomm. Uh, they have a field called SOC ID. Um, Android has this DTBO image metadata. It adds an optional ID revision in U32 or some custom fields. It's basically kind of what I was describing earlier with the um, QCDT image. Uh, where you just encode that MSMID into the metadata of the DTP image. Um, so U-Boot uses, uh, as far as I know, the file name to match the DTP. Um, so in U-Boot, there's this property that says, is this the right DTP? And it just matches. Uh, it's it's kind of similar to the compatible string. Um, Core Boot, I think, has some similar thing going on where they have, uh, you can match the vendor, like the main board. So like you could say, Trogdor or um, SM8650 QRD, along with some board ID and some SKU ID. Uh, so it's, it's actually pretty similar to what I think we should maybe be uh, trending towards, but it's not quite generic enough to work across every situation, and it's definitely not upstream standardized. So some of the things we want to try and do to have a unified DTP selection, um, you know, we want to try and lower the effort to support new boards. Um, we don't want to add custom string parsing that needs to get reviewed every single time. Um, you know, you want to go support a new bootloader. You just say, here's the ways to read some of these uh, properties that are in your uh, board uh, and go match them. Uh, you know, so you have just kind of a how. Um, we expect hardware to provide way more information than software can care about. We probably don't care about provision 2.1 of the QCM 6490 SOC. It's just, it's the QCM 6490 SOC. We don't, we don't care too much. Um, so that's more information that we care about. Um, we want it to be translatable to different DTP packaging formats. Um, so right now, U-Boot does something different than AVL does, which does something different than Core Boot. Um, and so my thinking is, let's try and make it sort of generic. Um, let the kernel be the source of truth. Um, and we want to have a documented mechanism for how to match these properties. So that way, um, the same DTP will work whether you use it on U-Boot or reuse it on Core Boot or use it on Grub. Um, or ABL. 
Um, so uh, during Plumbers last year, I was just chit-chatting with Christoph and Peter from the Google Pixel team and was like talking about this MSMID stuff. And we realized, oh, well, if everyone seems to be doing this, maybe we should just try and upstream a generic way of doing board IDs. Um, so I'm kind of in the early stages of figuring out what the design needs to look like. Um, so this is what I've currently come up with. Um, so you can see here that my proposal is we're just going to add a board ID uh, property in the root node. And um, that can go do one more. Yep. So the bootloader can query these different values and try and do a match. So these will be magic numbers. Uh, so there's some magic number for SM8650 and some magic number, well, that'll probably just be two. Um, and the bootloader can query, well, what is the QCOM stock version on this platform? Um, and it'll get some magic value, and it'll we'll try and compare that and see if it matches. Um, and if every property has a match, then we say, okay, this must be the right board. So if you can get an 8650 V2 with an HDK V1.1, um, this board is the right board. Um, and so similarly, uh, Pasquale, um, which is a Chromebook, uh, you know, what they're doing today is they have some compatible strings and they say, okay, well, there's two SKUs that we support, uh, SKU 22 and SKU 20. Um, so instead of encoding that in the compatible string, maybe we can encode that in the board ID and just say, okay, well, our board is the Pascal board uh, and we support these two SKUs of Pascal. Um, right. So U-boot and core boot and ABL are generally all UFI based. Um, so it'd be kind of neat, could be UFI based. So it'd be kind of neat if maybe we could create a UFI protocol in the future. So a vendor uh, who provides some core UFI services can just say, well, you ask me what the QCOM stock version is and I'll tell you what it is, um, you know, as a string. And so if you try and launch, you know, you have a Google uh, Pascal 360 DTB in your DTB image, and you're not running on any Chromebook hardware, uh, when you try and query for the Google board, it's just not going to give you, it's going to give you an EMVAL back. And so this would be kind of nice um, to be able to um, really be generic. And so U-Boot would just not even have a vendor-specific implementation uh, of reading these IDs. Right, and so fit is so. Um, fit is an image tree format that is kind of looks like DTB, um, and it encodes. Um, uh, it does have a selection mechanism for U-boot. Uh, you kind of describe a configuration region, um, and I'm thinking, well, we could just copy this board ID from your DTB uh, into the fit image if you want, or you can read the DTB. I'm not trying to say this is the way U-boot should implement it. I'm just trying to say. You know, we can put it in the official kernel and say, here's where the board ID is. Um, and however you boot or anyone who wants to generate a boot image can uh, mess with it however they like. Um, so we posted a couple of RFCs already. Um, and the feedback we got so, more, so far was just go get a community consensus. So I'm trying to use this talk to present our current idea uh, iteration and then get feedback from folks here. Uh, I think there's a pretty wide background uh, to find out if uh, you know, they, they think this is interesting or useful or we should just go back to the drawing board and do something that's specific. You know, maybe we should just say, use compatible strings, go away. Um, you know, so, yep. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a quick 20 minute introduction of what uh, this board ID concept is. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or we want to have a discussion about this proposal. Sumit, I know you want to talk about putting it from the firmware. <laughs> trees is very convenient and very helpful to have the same package software package to run on multiple hardware and I, I can echo with this approach it is something that we should do 
although uh, if at a point we get to the point that firmwares embed all these device trees, then that could be done at that stage as well. But yeah, at this point you would can do or any good router can do just yeah. pick up device tree from 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 the multiple So I'm um, <clears throat> trying to understand the value in describing the board ID to the kernel. Because mm -hmm. by the time you get to the kernel launch, you've already, the DTB's already been chosen and right. loaded. So who are you describing this information to? Right, so this would be to the bootloader. Okay. So the kernel authors a device tree, but it doesn't tell the bootloader or tell anybody this is what board it's for. You have to, someone's going to have to know and figure out, uh, well, the kernel authored this device tree that has this DTB or DTBO file. Well, I know when to apply that, but it requires magic knowledge that hopefully you can read the name of the DTB file name and you can figure it out, um, or you just have some other system that knows what to do. Uh, you know, it's just not a solved solution. So the goal is to try and say the kernel will tell the bootloader, here's which hardware I think it should apply to. But you talked about a UEFI runtime service or a yeah. UEFI service that could do this. U-Boot's the one that implements UEFIs, right. and it's also the one that has to choose. So who is it? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I don't know too much about how the U-Boot flow works, but at least in Qualcomm platforms, it's U-Boot would be probably chain-loaded. Um, okay. And so, you know, you can have like Qualcomm UFI services or some okay. vendor UFI services that know how to go read that or you upstream this to Tiana Core to EDK2 who you know will now know how to provide this information to every bootloader that is based off of UFI based off of EDK2 so again playing devil's advocate just no yeah that's perfect you. yeah um, so <clears throat> why isn't this as simple as this SOC means this base DTB then the board ID, this version, I look for, you know, is there a 1.1? No, well, I'll use 1.0. Right. Load that overlay, load the overlay for the display, load the overlay for this, and then the result has all the information the kernel needs. Right. No, that's exactly what we're trying to solve. So how would the... So you're trying to solve the problem of magic number to name. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay to solve that piecemeal at those levels that I talked about? Or do you need to, at this OCC, this board number could get different name? I don't think I followed. Okay. Um, well, like this. Mm -hmm. You got that SOC version. I don't, and you want to support those two version board version numbers. Right. To my mind, that's one SOC base DTB and two overlays for right. two different board versions. Right. Why don't just have them both and they can be sim links to each other or something like that? Right. So that could work. Um, I guess that relies on a file system being available to the bootloader, yeah, 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 which doesn't I mean, necessarily. Sim link in yeah, quotes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah, I think that rely on a, an assumption of how the DTBs are packaged. Okay, um, but fundamentally, you're talking about a way to mat, map magic numbers to this DTB names yes. for the DTBs, and it can be in piecemeal base and overlays. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I kind of thought the bus was query like for devices, I, I thought it pulled stuff, mm -hmm. but this looks like it's for faster booting or? No, so um, the buses will pull, this would be for like non-discoverable devices. So frequently you have, say, I'll give a very basic example of um, your display, you is generally non-discoverable. You just have to know, you gotta go talk to this, uh, you know, this address, uh, but between different board revisions, the address that you go right to could be different. So the way you discover devices would be different between boards. 
Um, yeah, not everything is discoverable over a bus. So the CDL is in EEPROM, did I hear that? Yep. Can you put the name in the EEPROM instead of the magic number? <laughs> yeah, so we have talked about doing that. The problem with putting the name in the magic, or the magic, the name in the EEPROM, is sometimes the name will change. Um, and so we'll ship devices uh, to customers uh, with a certain name, and that'll be like a code name. And then the actual like part name that this SM8650 um, is probably the name that the community would care about. Um, and so we're interested in supporting devices that go through the whole life cycle. You know, I mean, once it's shipped to somebody externally, you kind of want to support support that. In fact, we actually saw this for the uh, X Elite halfway through the bring up, where we changed the part, the name of the part um, during that. We posted patches, and it said one name, and then halfway through, we changed the name. Um, that's just kind of how <laughs> an unfortunate consequence of making chips. In, I used to be with TI, and we had daughter cards. Well, um, even Beagle, BeagleBone has this. The, the boards you can plug onto it can identify themselves with a, a magic number. Right. And so the, you want to find some way to match that magic number to the overlay that you need to apply that's for that a, cape. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's another instance of this. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Let's have a generic solution so that way the bootloader doesn't have to write a whole lot of custom logic uh, for it. We can have some sort of uh, ABI that describes how to match that. So even if it wasn't a runtime service, if it was a C function. Yeah, it could just be a C function. That was super portable, and you could yes. plug into lots of bootloaders. Yes. This would solve your yes. issue. Yes, yes, okay. for sure. I was just a proposal of like, okay, well now U boot has to do even less work, or Core boot has to do less work. But if we want to do it per platform, that's probably how we want to start anyway. Because uh, if we like this approach, U boot's probably going to be one of the first ones to do it, and we're not going to be able to go straight to EDK too and say, here's this new, brand new standardized protocol take it and it's not tested or fleshed out, you know, we haven't worked out all the kinks. So I came for the opposite problem where you have, the board knows what it wants, but you have different operating systems and you want to deliver a different DTB to each operating system. Right. Could you just write the memory address or whatever into the memory so you pull that up and then you know where to write for your display? So instead of having a magic number, you just give the information that make it discoverable from the information it, in the firmware. It's usually not that simple. So like for instance, uh, I'll, I'll take another example of like say an audio codec or an audio accelerator. ADSP might be different between two different chipsets or two different boards, right? You have some uh, some address that you want to go talk to, but it could be a completely different chip. And so it's not just simply talking to a different address. It's it's a whole different driver that needs to be probed. And so then that kind of gets into the territory of just fixing up your DTB, and now that creates a whole binding of the bootloader needs to know what the DTB is going to look like and know how to fix it up, and that kind of gets into a headache of fix-ups which can fail. So although it's just a repetition of like my morning talk, but maybe I would just like to clarify how do you think that the secure boot could be implemented or how could you verify all these packaged DTBs, whether Qualcomm is going to sign them all or whether it's the device vendors, are they going to sign them? Um, so I've, it's been a little bit since I've looked in how all the system ready stuff is going to work. Um, so I guess I, I don't want to answer that directly because I don't want to say something and somebody tells me, well, you didn't get that right. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, that's the problem we face when we say, I want to enable secure boot, but how we can assign, like, 
those bundles of DTPs. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, right now they're coming from the distro, right? They're coming from the kernel or whoever is packaging. Um, Shouldn't so. they just be signed by the same person signing the kernel, right? So, like, if if you're packaging with the kernel, you can sign them with the same signature key that the kernel has, at least unless you're trying to use those same DTBs in U-Boot, in which case there's maybe a question. But uh, if you're if all you're doing is taking the DTBs and passing them to the kernel, right, then if you don't trust the kernel, then, like, essentially the kernel could ignore whatever you gave it. And so, you know, the, the kernel signing key should, if anything, be stronger anyway. So it, in that sense, it would work fine for a signing. But if, but if you wanted to try to use the, the DTBs that were packaged with the kernel, then you, need, then you get into questions. So uh, actually, the question is not about whether it's easier to sign or not. It's whether the distro vendor or the OS vendor can actually vouch for those device trees that these are the appropriate ones to be used for this particular hardware. Yes, you can say, I can pick up from this kernel version and I could sign them all. But do that DTB is supporting all the features that are needed for those devices. Right. I mean, that re is the kernel supporting all the features that are needed for those devices either? Yeah. I mean, that, 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 I'm saying it's the same level of trust, right? I mean, you, this person's providing you a kernel, so how do you know the kernel provides the features that were right for the hardware? So maybe uh, to better explain it, say, for example, I'm a device vendor, and uh, you are the OS vendor. So you are providing me the OS, and I want to say, that this is my device behavior, how it should work with the OS, or how it should, it should work with the upstream OS. And I vouch for my device and how it should be described. Can you vouch for the device? <laughs> or like, I, I remember seeing the EFI system partition packaging like whole of the DTBs from ARM64 tree or from ARM tree. Can they vouch for all of those device trees? <laughs> That's something that was thought answerable to me. Maybe you have. I mean, I think my thought on that is just if it, if the device trees are bundled with the kernel, then the kernel is the one vouching for them, not the device vendor, right? And the, so, you know, if the device vendor can get the device trees and the driver support into the kernel, right? And they they have to do both of those things, and then. Whoever is bundling the kernel vouches for both of those things. So the, the device manufacturer isn't involved in vouching for either of them, and so therefore isn't involved in signing them. If the device trees are bundled with U-Boot or with the, the firmware, then you certainly they have to talk about vouching for them. But when they're bundled with the kernel, I think it's the kernel's vouching and the kernel signing that matters. Basically, you need a public key that should be bundled into the bootloader. <laughs> How you can verify those DTBs. <laughs> it, it can be done, but there's something that you decide. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the kernel could also just, I mean, if you can't trust the kernel, you can also just throw away whatever. You know, the kernel could be just throwing away the DTB and, and loading whatever it wants. So our kind of, at least, I think Doug and I are on the sort of same page. It's, it, it just comes from the kernel. Somebody packages together DTB and a bootloader and a kernel and some user space. And however you want to sign that, that's up to you. But the device tree doesn't come from some other magical place. It's, it comes from the community. And so it comes from, from the same source. I do. I haven't thought it all the way through. But one of the things that I think about when I'm, I'm looking at your proposed solution is whether or not just going all in on overlays is is maybe a solution to some of this stuff. So, so stuff some stuff incompatible, but then really kind of like just go in and have overlay after overlay after overlay applied to something. So you right. sort of say, you know, you first apply the baseboard, or sorry, the SOC level DTB, 
And then you're like, you get the board level overlay, and then you get the rev, rev level overlay. And if something is specific to a given rev and a given skew, then the overlay says, you know, I need rev and skew in its compatible string. Right. And then you, you sort of like have a whole set of things that can be in the compatible string that says whether or not the overlay applies. And so, <clears throat> for instance, if you boot a Pasqual skew 22 and skew 20, you, you see that and it's just an overlay and you just apply the overlay if it matches that. But you also start out with more basic stuff. So you start out with just, right, just the sock, just the sock right. then just the board, and then you, you kind of apply overlays that way. I haven't thought it through to see if it would really work, but. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we'd have to, I mean, I think we sort of talked offline that the SKUs are sort of bit fields for Chromebooks as well, and, and that's what we do as well. Um, well, I think, I think in that case, maybe the Chromebooks would, would actually, should anything that's a bit field, Right, the Chromebook should actually say, you know, Google Pasqual touchpad A. Right. And so then it should start looking for Google Pasqual touchpad A right. overlay and yep. Google Pasqual touchpad B overlay. Right. And the firmware would then know how to map bit two in the SKU ID as, you know, touch field A versus B. Right. And then, so it, you would have to, it wouldn't work backward compatible. It wouldn't, you couldn't just go do this to old devices, but for new devices going forwards, you could try to maybe make it more sane and go all in on overlays and maybe it would work. Right. Um. Um, so what Doug is saying is basically what Simon Glass has proposed for U-Boot fit image extensions. So the base sock would be a DTB, and then everything else would be a DTB overlay. And the firmware kind of has to produce uh, some list of compatible strings that it knows that the, the board has these features. And then it will go through the fit image and look for extensions that match these um, compatible strings and then apply the overlays. That's essentially the extensions proposal. Right. Um, I, I guess we could potentially get into a problem where, say you have touchpad A, I'll just use yours as, as an example, um, and for whatever reason it needs to go mention some clocks and regulators, and those clocks and regulator P handles might change depending on which, say, PMIC you're attached to or which board version you're attached to, and so now you have to actually describe, well, I'm on SKU, you know, I have PMIC A plus touchpad A, and so it can kind of devolve really quickly into you know, you have these really long compatible strings and you go back to potentially, back, 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 yeah. You go back to this, uh, you know, the really long. I guess. I'd be curious to see if, if that happens in practice, right? So certainly I think there will be some cases like that. Like I could imagine that touchpad A and touchpad B are hooked up differently on revision two versus revision four of the board, right? right? And so then you may have, you know, one overlay that says for revisions two and three, touchpad A looks like this. And for revisions right. four and up, touchpad A looks like this. So right. you'd have to have some sort of conditionalized thing for the extensions. But I would hope that it wouldn't go past like three or four things and not up to 20, right? Because, yeah, that's right. because it's unlikely it's yeah. going to be like conditional on UFS and conditional right. on, you know, your SDRAM part and everything. So if you just list, list the ones that it's conditional on, maybe it would be manageable. Right. But firmware is not going to know what it cares about, right? Well, I mean, but, but the, the device tree itself, if it sees, it just basically is an and of all the components. So if you see a, an extension and it, the, the extension lists, you know, revision and touchpad. Right. Then when the firmware is looking through the extension, it says, well, it wants revision and touchpad. I have both of those. Apply right. it. Right. And so it doesn't need to have any smarts as long as the kernel device tree thing lists the proper set of ands right. in its compatible. I guess then you lose out on um, have, like, that means you now have to port that parsing to every bootloader you care about. Which sure. I mean, any of these things that's probably true on. Right. So, but if we come up with a standard, maybe it's not such a bad deal to, to put that parsing in every bootloader because it's a standard. Right. So. Um, so Simon's uh, proposal is kind of the opposite. So the, the 
firmware has to produce all the extension compatibles and not parse the uh, base DDB. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, and see. then also extensions has like dependencies. So uh, say your touchpad um, A on revision two would, would depend on the revision two board and not the revision four board. Yeah. Interesting. I, I, yeah. I, that's only a proposal. Like, there's no code attached to it. So. Yeah, I mean, there's no code attached to this either, because <laughs> we're all just trying to have a discussion here. But um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think generating a long list of all the compatible strings then gets complicated, because if you have five different things, you need to have five plus four plus three plus two. You know. Yeah, that's true. So I don't think you need it to be in the compatible. The compatible can be fairly generic. It's the device tree content that needs to be customized. So what you need, what you end up for is some really long overlays to look for, right. um, overlay names to look for. And it's like, oh, I don't have that over, let me simplify it to just these two. Oh, I have that one, let me apply that one. Oh, I don't, I don't even have that one. I just have the touchpad A, I'll apply that one. Right. So if you can come up with a mapping of the really long names to potential overlays to apply and then simplify them out until you find a match, you can do that. Right. But yes. it comes back to this having a good way to have a directory of the DTBs, um, maybe symlinks and, and you know, some sort of symlink-like structure right. so that you can process this quickly. Right. You don't want to be doing a directory search for each one of yeah. these things. Yeah, definitely parsing the strings could take a while if they're long or, yeah. So does this pretty much let old software run on a new board? Is that kind of what it's for? So you have the your existing image that works with everything and then you got a new board but you don't want to update the image, so you... you right, yeah, don't. so I mean, if, if you're, I mean, you have to have a bootloader that supports, like, right, once you've established the board ID and, you know, this is sort of settled out, when, once you have a new board, yeah, you don't have to update your kernel image. You would just define your new compatible string or your new board ID, and it would just, yeah, pick it up. Yeah, I mean, I, I still kind of feel like compatible string parsing gets really complicated pretty quickly. So I, I don't, I'd be interested to see if there's a proposal somebody has in mind for mapping out, um, you know, all these properties and to see how it can simplify. Because. But, but why do you need SKU 22 in the compatible at all? I'll ask these guys. <laughs> I mean, I think that, that one thing that's a little weird is that there's no other thing to match against for device trees today, right? So we have basically a, a flat list of device trees, right? And then the only thing that the bootloader that's documented for how the bootloader can pick which device tree. The bootloader, the kernel provides all the device trees, kind of a flat list of all the device trees. And the bootloader knows what hardware it's on. It knows what its revision is, what its SKU is. And so it looks at all the device trees that the kernel provided and it has to pick one. And then it picks one and gives it to the kernel. And so that's the problem that we are solving, right? That we're trying to solve. And that is what works today for us. But of course, you get into this complaint that that top level compatible string is in there specifically to help the bootloader pick a device tree. That's what, on Chromebooks, that's what that top level compatibility string means. It's, hey, bootloader, this is how you pick our device tree based on what you know. And so that's actually always been kind of a negative. Uh, I think Upstream has, has not been the happiest about that sometimes because it means you get weird compatible strings like this and you, know, you get listed more than one rev and more than one SKU and you get these complicated things that we spent a bunch of time arguing with Rob and Christoph about in the past. Uh, and so you know, ironically, you could kind of, if you had something more like what Elliot has here where you had some other way that the bootloader 
could pick the device trees among a whole list, right? Maybe it's something like a board ID or whatever. You could actually have the, the bootloader write a compatible string that just contained the one board that you're on. <laughs> and, and then the bootloader, if the bootloader is no longer using that, right, like it could actually create that compatible string and it would suddenly look more like what, you know, Rob and Christoph and the device tree folks have always kind of wanted is to see just the board itself in that device tree compatible. But, and so, yeah, if you, oh, if yeah, you had yeah, something like, else, right, like, yeah. like in, essentially if we were on a SKU 2 Pasquale, then we could figure out, hey, we match against this, and then the bootloader could theoretically write just Google Pasquale SKU 22, done. That's what we're on. And it wouldn't have more than one thing there, which right. would be kind of neat. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, another way I had kind of been thinking about uh, that reminded me. Compatible strings should maybe be a description to the software of what hardware you're on. And so when you describe you're on SKU 22 and SKU 20, what if you need to do a workaround for only SKU 22? Now, what do you do? Well, then the kernel splits it into yeah, two device trees, split. right? But if, if user space, the problem is if user space wants to know what yeah. SKU it's on, it can't use that compatible string. It has to use something else. And right now we export the actual SKU in some other property in the yeah, device tree. Yeah, we do too, yeah. To device tree, you're declaring that you are a SKU 22, which is also compatible with a SKU 20. You're not on a SKU 20, yeah. according to device tree, with that compatible string. <clears throat> That's what it means for anything other than the top-level compatible string, at least in the case of how Chromebooks work. What that says is I am on either a, a SKU 22 or a SKU 20. What's that? Well, what, what, what you look for every other device except for the top level, if you read that, you would say, I have a SKU 22, and it's also compatible with SKU 20. For Chromebooks for the top-level one, that does not say that. This says... I am either a SKU 22 or a SKU 20. I could be either of them because from software's point of view, there is no difference right now. So, and that's the thing that's always been weird for that top level compatible string and something that has always made people like Rob and Christoph unhappy. Um, but, you know, and so we could potentially make them happier if we stopped using the compatible string like that. But, that is the way that it has historically worked for Chromebooks because there was no other way. So, and, and it's been like that for years. In fact, even though Elliot said that the U-boot method is different, actually, I think the U-boot method and the, uh, the depth charge core boot method is pretty much the same. Oh. So they both use fit image, and I think they both use the same rev and skew stuff. And maybe even the Tegra stuff is a Chromebook also because there were Tegra Chromebooks. OK, maybe so. it was. I think most of this rev skew stuff is all from Chrome OS in the past. I'm going to dumb this down a little bit. Um, I guess for those of us who don't have as much board variation, maybe uh, two or three for a particular product, yeah. what recommendation or which method would you recommend uh, to, to um, differentiate and select the... Right, device? so I mean, under the scheme that I'm proposing, you would go write an upstream thing that says, here's how you find out which revision I'm on. So you could do, you know, um, I am manufacturer blah, a foo, and uh, I have this property called foo, comma, whatever you want to differentiate on. And if it's one, two, or three, you know, this is, you know, how you, and then you describe how to read that property. Um, and so you would, it would actually be much easier, I think, under the board ID scheme versus doing a compatible string, at least in my opinion. Um, I don't, did that answer your question? Yeah. Also, if you're only trying to land one bootloader. Yeah. That's true. I mean, if you're only using U-boot, most people just code this into U-boot, right? Yeah. There's a board-specific function that reads an EEPROM, generates the generates the the okay. name that you should look for or the list of names that you should look for. But right. but I, I think Elliot is trying to solve the problem for multiple More bootloaders the, simultaneously. Yeah, Qualcomm wants to put our hardware everywhere, so we want to support more than just 
Yeah, so there. one thing that's um, slightly more flexible with U-Boot is that your board DTB compatible string doesn't have to be the same as the compatible string in your configuration node. So you could like have some custom mapping and that would live in some external file. Um, that's part of fit. Yeah, that's part of fit. Yeah, but we don't currently like have such an extension. That's right. Um, so you could have like an external mapping, but that only works for fit images and whatever like custom uh, boot image format you have that could support it. So if you were like looking through the file system and just looking at the DTBs directly, that wouldn't work. We're out of time, so thanks everyone for coming.